Okay, so we are team red, white, and blonde. I'm Alexis Magato. I'm Jeff Falcon, and I'm Hannah Dearbaum. And we will be taking you through Jason's journey. So imagine you are a brand new clinician beginning your clinical fellowship year at St. Nick's Memorial Hospital, a hospital focusing on brain injury rehabilitation. Within your first few hours on the job, you receive a new client on your caseload, Jason. While looking through his file, two things jump out at you right away. One, he is your age, and two, he has just been involved in an accident that will most likely change the entire course of his life. It is your responsibility to ensure that he has everything to maintain a successful recovery process. But where do you begin? So the first thing you want to do is take a look, <laughs> take a look through the case history in order to get to know your client a little better. So Jason is a 25-year-old male who was involved in a traumatic brain injury after sustaining a fall while working for his commercial roofing company. So after receiving his TBI, and Hannah will later go on to explain the neurology of traumatic brain injuries, he was transferred to a nearby hospital where he was immediately intubated and immobilized until spinal stability was established. In addition to his TBI, he received significant shoulder injuries. While at the prior facility, he was given two scales to assess his current level of functioning, the Rancho Los Amigos scale and the Glasgow Coma score. And 10 days following his injury, he was transferred to your hospital, where he arrived on your caseload. So in terms of his Glasgow Coma score, he was at a total of six, indicating he's currently at a comatose level. He demonstrated an eye-open response only to pain, he has no verbal response, and he has an abnormal flexion response, so he's very stiff, rigid posture. In terms of his rancher level, he's at a 3, indicating he has a localized <coughs> response. This means that he is able to respond to certain stimuli, but his responses are very variable and also delayed. And in order to give you a better idea of Jason's current level of functioning, we have a video to demonstrate. <laughs> Hey Jason, I'm Alexis, your speech language pathologist. I'm just going to ask you a few questions today and see how you're doing. So can you tell me what day it is? Alright, it's currently October 14th, 2016. And do you know where you're at right now? You are currently at St. Nick's Hospital. Great, so I'm going to do a couple tests just to check your reflexes, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do... Okay, well... It's good checking up on you today, and I'll be in again soon to see how everything's going. So as you can see in the video, Jason has no response to any kind of verbal prompts that the clinician is offering him. He is unable to respond. However, he does open his eyes in response to pain. So when the clinician digs her fingernail into his nail bed gently, we don't want to injure him any more than he's already been injured, he opens his eyes. Also, he has a stiff, rigid posture. As Alexis said earlier, he did sustain severe brain, brain damage after falling off the roof at work. He sustained damage to three main areas of his brain. The first being his cerebellum, which is the picture on your left. This area's main function is to maintain equilibrium as well as help coordinate skilled motor activity. Due to Jason currently being immobilized for spinal stability, we're unsure how this is affecting his movement patterns, both physically and in relation to speech. So we will have to get a better idea of this as he increases and is, being, and is more stable. The second area are the lateral ventricles in his brain. Your ventricular system is a system of spaces that are filled with cerebrospinal fluid that serve as a protection mechanism for your brain against trauma. When Jason fell, his brain lost the ability to drain any excess fluid that may fill these spaces, causing them to enlarge. This will need to be addressed surgically to drain any excess fluid, and this is important to do as soon as possible because it has been shown that complex mental process Activity areas of the brain are usually most commonly affected when these enlarge. The final area of damage, he sustained a subdural hematoma in the superior posterior region of his brain. 
As you can see in the picture, a hematoma is essentially a pooling of blood. In Jason's case, it's between his dura and arachnoid matter. As you can also see in the picture, there's extensive brain damage around this hematoma. Due to the fact that these can cause irreversible brain damage if left untreated, we will need to do this surgery as soon as possible to drain any excess fluid. Once Jason goes through these surgeries and reaches a more stable condition, we'll be able to get a better idea of his baseline. So to start, we decided to focus more on family interviews and counseling <coughs> treatment process. In this family interview, we gained a few key insights into Jason's life. First off, his family has no prior experience with traumatic brain injuries, and they expect a full recovery, which is normal for any family. We also found out that Jason and his fiance are planning to be married in eight months. This is also very critical information. This helps us figure out we need to set a clear prognosis for his family to let them know where Jason's currently at and where we see treatment progressing over the course of the next few months so they're able to better plan and prepare for any future events. As Jason's clinician, it is imperative that you implement an evidence-based process approach. So that's exactly what we did. In order to do so, you start by asking a clinical question. This is based off of your client, your resources, and your hoped outcome. After making your question, you can then search for the best available evidence and analyze that evidence. In combination with the evidence that you find, you take into consideration your clinical experience and the client, and you can come to a clinical decision. In a real-world setting, you would then implement that decision and evaluate the outcome. As I said, you start with a clinical question. This is affectionately known as the PICO question, which you've heard. PICO stands for Population, Intervention, Comparison, and Outcome. Our population is based off of Jason, so it's adults with traumatic brain injury. We did not specify a type of brain injury or a level of severity. Our intervention is metacognitive intervention. We're comparing that to cognitive intervention, and we hope to be able to improve Jason's executive functioning skills and his activities of daily living. To give you a better idea of what our question is in our process, we're going to define some of these terms even further for you. Starting with cognition. We define cognition as the process of acquiring and understanding knowledge based on your thoughts, experiences, and senses. Cognitive rehabilitation therapy is a really broad term for any type of intervention aimed at an impairment in cognition. So having an understanding of what cognitive therapy might look like, you can then start to think about metacognitive therapy. And Alexis is gonna help you do so. All right, so in the research we looked at, metacognition was considered a higher level thinking skill that involves analysis or analyzing one's own behavior and thinking processes. So metacognition is a process that essentially transcends cognition. The root word meta itself means beyond. So we can kind of think of metacognition as a process that goes beyond traditional cognition. So these were words that were frequently associated with metacognition within the articles we looked at. So it involves essentially thinking about thinking, monitoring one's own behaviors, self-regulating, and self-questioning and reflection as well. Finally, for our outcome, which is improvements in executive functioning, for this project, we've defined executive function as the ability to engage successfully in independent, purposeful, and self-serving behaviors. As you can see by this graphic, there are multiple components to this, such as planning, organization, and self-regulation. People with traumatic brain injuries typically have some sort of a deficit in this area, so we thought it would be a good place to start with treatment for Jason. Now that the PICO question is set in place, we then started to search for the evidence. We pulled terms specifically from our PICO question and searched across a wide range of databases, including the ASHA evidence maps, EBSCOhost, PubMed, and SpeechBite. We found a plethora of research on this PICO question, and we organized it here for you in a pyramid-type format, which you have seen before in the other presentations. The highest level of evidence is at the top of the pyramid, all the way down to the lowest level of evidence. As you can see, we do have a lot of our evidence concentrated at the top of the pyramid, and in order to give you a better idea of what the literature is saying behind these two approaches, we picked out three specific researchers. So one of the first systematic reviews we encountered in our research process was from the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation in 2013. Essentially, what their goal was to do was create a set of clinical guidelines by analyzing existing literature in order to determine the best treatment approach for clients with mild traumatic brain injuries. So they looked at 24 different research articles in order to take a look at the efficacy and the outcomes of these articles. Overall, their findings were that cognitive strategies were beneficial, however, they should be used in conjunction with remediation approaches and compensatory strategies. 
Also in 2013, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network published clinical guidelines in relation to the long-term treatment of adults with mild traumatic brain injury. They looked at the literature from 1990 all the way to 2011 using a very systematic methodology. They found level B evidence related to executive functioning intervention. Level B evidence that came from two systematic reviews and two randomized control trials. Overall, the evidence pointed toward the use of metacognitive interventions in the context of activities of daily living. So for Jason, this is pointing us more toward the metacognitive side of intervention and also making sure that we're making it functional for him within his activities of daily living. Finally, the last article we looked at was a non-randomized control trial conducted by Robertson and Schmitter Edgecombe in 2015. This article looked at the dynamic comprehensive model of awareness and within that model examined four specific variables metacognitive awareness, anticipatory awareness, self-regulation, and error monitoring. For Jason's case, we focus specifically on the metacognitive awareness aspect of the study. For this task, or in this study, excuse me, they had two groups. Each group had 90 participants total. One group had moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries, and the second group were age match control peers. For the metacognitive awareness task, they were given the problems in everyday living questionnaire which provides situations in which practical problem-solving skills are needed to talk your way out of how you would get out of a problem. For example, one of the questions might be, if you were lost in the forest in the middle of the day, how would you go about finding your way out? All of the participants were asked these questions and their responses were recorded and scored on a scale of zero to three. The higher the score was, the more metacognitive awareness abilities they had. At the end of this study, we did a follow-up six months to a year later, 49 participants from each group came back to go through this follow-up. Although there was no significant difference between the two groups themselves, within the traumatic brain injury group, there was a significant increase in metacognitive awareness skills, showing that this, their skills did increase. <coughs> now that you've had a chance to meet with your client, talk to his family, and review the, existence, the existing research base, raise your hand if you feel comfortable selecting a specific treatment measure to use with him. Keep in mind that your first treatment session begins tomorrow morning. <laughs> so for those of you who did not raise your hand, we feel the same way. We were able to find quite a bit of extensive research that supports <coughs> metacognitive strategies for individuals with TBI. However, a lot of our research recommended using cognitive strategies in combination with metacog in order to yield the best effects. Essentially, cognition and metacognition go hand in hand. You can't have metacognition without cognition itself. And although we were able to find quite a bit of evidence, this resulted in not having a narrow enough research base to choose a very specific intervention that would be most beneficial for Jason. So in order to narrow down the existing research base we had, we had to narrow down our PICO question, which leads us to PICO question number two. <laughs> so. After consulting both Mrs. Taylor and Dr. Hallowell, we decided to focus more on attention-based strategies for Jason. <coughs> Following the same framework just went through with you at the beginning of the presentation, our population is still adults with traumatic brain injury because we're still trying to find that perfect treatment for Jason. Our intervention is now attention, attention process training, or APT, which is a direct attention training, and we're comparing it to COGSMART, which is a cognitive rehabilitative therapy. Our new outcome, is improvements in attention across daily living environments. The reason we chose attention is because this is one of the more common deficits occurring in people with traumatic brain injuries, so we thought that we would want Jason to be able to attend to tasks before we can move on to more complex interventions. So by now, this should look pretty familiar to all of you. Again, we have the evidence-based practice pyramid. We've searched the literature based on our PICO questions specifically, and we looked across several databases. The literature we found is displayed here. This is for both APT and COGSMART. In order to give you a better idea of the research backing these interventions, we picked two specific research studies for each treatment approach. Starting with attention process training, or APT. There are multiple versions of this training currently out. The second version deals more with CDs that you display in your computer, and the newest version, which is APT3, is a more computer software-based system. The nice thing about this training is it's extremely customizable, so we thought that would be really good for Jason, so we can figure out exactly where his baseline is and we can work his way up. As you progress through this program, not only do the attention tasks themselves become more difficult, but the distractors used within the tasks themselves also become more complex. This program also focuses on five specific areas of attention. 
focused, selective, sustained, alternating, and divided. So for the research backing this process, this, this intervention, excuse me, the first article was by Barman and colleagues in 2016. This was a systematic review that was an online literature search resulting in 99 articles that discussed various treatment strategies that are currently being used with patients who have a traumatic brain injury. In terms of the attention strategies, APT was one of the ones they found research on. They found that using this type of a treatment did lead to increases in complex attention skills. They also found combining a direct attention training, such as APT, with a metacognitive training also led to more significant results. The second article we found was by Solberg and colleagues in 2000. This was a study that compared APT with an educational and support-based training. Within this study, there were 14 participants, all of who had an acquired traumatic brain injury. They started in two separate conditions. The first condition, they received APT for 24 hours over a 10-week period, and in the second condition, they got an educational support method intervention for 10 hours over a 10-week period. Once each group went through that condition, they switched and completed the opposing condition. At the end of the study, they found overall greater increases in attention skills following attention process training, and then within attention process training itself, they also found not only increases in attention skills, but also increases in memory, which we thought could be very applicable to Jason's case. Now to give you guys a little idea of what a type of activity might look like, Alexis is going to lead you through one right now. All right, so this is a video that we found online that was taken from the attention process training protocol. So for this activity, you're going to hear some words that we want you to pay very close attention to. So what we want you to do is you're going to knock on the table if you hear a word that is opposite of the word that came before it. For example, if the word is hot and the second word is cold, you will knock on your table. And keep in mind that you're going to be listening for these words while in the presence of background noise. Although most of us think of the brain sister single structure is actually brother abs. These parts child or hemispheres are tight built together inside the skull and cloudy by several distinct bundles of sunny fibers, which serve as smart communication between them. Gifted each hemisphere appears to be a proper rainbow mirror image of the other. Silver, in keeping with the general left-right symmetry of the human body. In fact, light, the control of the body's basic movement of light vision, is even even rude. Great. So now that you have a better idea of the types of activities you'll be doing with APT, just will lead you into the comparison treatment, CogSmart. CogSmart stands for Cognitive Symptom Management and Rehabilitation Therapy. The main goal of CogSmart is to incorporate compensatory strategies into the individual's everyday life. And they want to make this as automatic as possible, as possible for that individual. CogSmart not only focuses on attention, but other cognitive strategies, including executive functioning, problem solving, and perspective memory. Uh, CogSmart can be implemented in a variety of settings, and there is no extensive training required in order to administer CogSmart. So it is a pretty flexible treatment program. The research behind Cogsmart, as you can see, has some overlap between researchers. In addition, Dr. Elizabeth Twainley is the developer of Cogsmart, so we took this into consideration when analyzing this evidence. In 2014, Co Twainley and her colleagues looked at Cogsmart in the context of enhanced supported employment. They looked at veterans as the population, there were 50 individuals included. Their measure of attention was the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale 3rd Edition. They found that there was a decrease in post-concussive symptoms which could be physical, cognitive, or emotional in, in variety. And they also found that the individuals who received Cogsmart training perceived it as helpful. In 2015, Twainley and her colleagues were again looking at the same intervention in the same population in the context of enhanced supported employment. This time they looked at the effects over a year time span. So they took measurements at six months and 12 months post intervention. The findings here were that there was an increase in quality of life as reported of, on the quality of life inventory by the individuals who received Cogsmart training in addition to the supported employment. At this time, we've decided that this is not the best treatment for Jason. This decision was based on three main points. First, there is limited evidence backing Cogsmart as an intervention program. Second, there is a lack of variety in researchers looking at Cogsmart specifically. 
And lastly, we hope to see more specific measures of achievement and success in this population, especially related to attention since that is our people question. That is not to say that we did not find some valuable information while researching Cogsmart. One thing we hope to include from Cogsmart is the use of compensatory strategies, especially those that are more metacognitive in nature. So for example, related to attention specifically, one of the strategies that they hope to implement with their individuals is self-talk in the context of a, com of a conversation. So for example, you would use self-talk to help you maintain and generate attention to your communication partner and what they're saying in order to have a successful conversation. Okay, earlier in the presentation, Jess introduced the framework we use to help us to help guide us in our clinical decision-making process. So far, we've asked not only one, but two FICO questions. We've acquired the evidence, we've appraised it, we've aggregated it within our models, and that brings us to applying what we've learned. In order to make our decision, we considered three separate factors. One was the current best evidence, and as Jess and Hannah just explained, we compared the two treatments, CogSmart and APT, in order to determine which yielded the best results and which would be most applicable for our client. Second, we wanted to consider our patient's values. So Jason is a young man. He values his independence, his, ab his ability to communicate with his family, his friends, and his fiance. Additionally, since his job requires it, he wants to be able to be aware of his environment and make those planning and decision-making skills. Lastly, we took into consideration clinical expertise. Although we don't have a huge population of clients with traumatic brain injuries within our own clinic, we were able to discuss with Mrs. Taylor and Dr. Hallowell what they might do in this situation and what they've done in the past in order to give us more experience with the clinical aspect of treatment. In summary, our clinical decision has three main components. First, we do plan to implement attention process training. In addition to that, however, we feel it's important to implement some metacognitive strategies for Jason, specifically self-talk, self-evaluation, and self-awareness. Lastly, based on our first round of evidence, we do feel that we need to address the psychosocial component for Jason to provide a more holistic treatment approach. This would include brain education and social support specifically. Lastly, as we were looking through our research, we did find some areas that we hope to see improved in the future. Specifically, in regards to limitations, we didn't find that a lot of the articles talked about generalization to ADLs outside of the context of the treatment. So they looked more specifically how they progressed through the treatment and not so much how it carried over to other situations. We also want to see some more research addressing more severe cases, although, especially in Jason's case, since he is essentially comatose right now, we wouldn't necessarily begin treatment right away, but we do want to see as he progresses a little bit if there are any treatments proven to be beneficial that you can start at a more severe level. We also would like to see some more research that compares more specific treatments. Although Cogsmart did look at that compared to enhanced supported employment, we would like to see some more treatment that, or some more research that compares specific treatments such as APT versus Cogsmart. We would also like to see a more variety in researchers. As just stated, the developer of Cogsmart has done the, the majority of the research, but not only this, but with other treatments, just because that gives you a different view of how these treatments could potentially be used for your clients in clinical settings. For the first of our thank yous, we would like to present the Oscar for Best Leading Actor to Tyler Roman. We appreciate you um, being our persona of Jason for this project. It helped make it a little more personal for us and get a little more connected with our client. So thank you for that. <laughs> and finally, we would like to thank Dr. Hallowell and Mrs. Taylor for your guidance throughout this process. We know you guys are extremely busy, but we really appreciate you taking time out of those crazy schedules to help us and provide us with your wealth of knowledge on this topic to help us make the best clinical decision for Jason. like you are the only group that reported reviving your people question, at least explicitly. So now that you have find, found some evidence for your second people question, does that help answering the first people question that you formulated? I definitely think it does, um, especially with some of the attention processing training articles more specifically. They did mention some more, like incorporating more metacognitive and cognitive aspects as well in terms of compensatory treatments, like Jess was saying. So I think being able to tie them back, I think we do have a better idea of what we would do with the first PICO question. 
I think the first PICO question is still extremely broad, and we didn't realize that getting into it, so we were a little over our heads with all the research we found. Um, but I definitely think narrowing in on a more specific area of intervention helped us figure out how we could further tie in those metacognitive and cognitive interventions to something specific. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering about, um, you were talking about if there were any sort of treatments that might be, that you could find that you could do with this patient earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering if you had run across anything around coma stimulation type programs and if that was a consideration. Um, and then I was waiting, I wanted to see a video of um, Tyler at RLA4. It was really oh, sorry. Just, <laughs> sorry. Um, so just wondering about coma stimulation and then when do you think you would start um, something like APT in terms of the RLA level? We did not find any information on coma stimulation that I recall. As Hannah mentioned, we did find a broad range of evidence, so it could have been in some of the systematic reviews that we reviewed. Um, but I don't remember specifically when they that. None of them talked about it specifically okay. now. Mm -hmm. um, after talking to Dr. Howell, we have thought about at what level we would be implementing treatment for Jason. And that would really depend on he needs to be able to attend to our task, and that's kind of what we're pushing for at this point. But looking more at level five and six for Jason to begin treatment. Any other questions? 